Greetings everyone and welcome to this new video series about Qt containers in Qt 5 and Qt 6. My name is Giuseppe D'Angelo, I am a senior software engineer here at KDAB. I work a lot with uh, Qt, I develop Qt itself. And so uh, following our tradition of uh, introducing a few of the Qt 6 changes to you, I'm actually going to backtrack a little bit and give you an overview of the Qt container classes both in Qt 5 and in Qt 6. So what are we going to see in uh, this video series? Uh, we are going to discuss uh, the Qt containers at large. I'm going to introduce to you first and foremost, why does Qt even have container classes? I mean, Qt is a C++ framework and C++ comes with its own container classes from the standard library. So what does Qt need its own? Well, we are going to see why. We're going to see how they work. Uh, first and foremost, they are general common traits, things that are common amongst all the Qt containers. And then we're going to focus a little bit more in detail uh, about uh, the various container classes that we have. We have sequential containers, we have associative containers. We also have some special ones that, uh, uh, well, we'll see when we encounter them, uh, how they behave and why they may be useful to your own code. Finally, we're going to conclude this video series with, if you want, a comparison between the Qt containers and the standard library containers. Uh, depending on your use case, you may want to use the ones from Qt, the ones from the standard library, maybe both. That depends on what you're doing in your application. So to kickstart this series, let me explain to you uh, why does Qt even have containers in the first place? Where do they come from? And uh, why as application developers should you be concerned about the availability of Qt containers? Should you exploit them or not? Well, let's see together why is that. Uh, Qt ships with a huge collection of container classes. Okay, things like QList, QVector, QMap. If you have used Qt for more than five minutes, surely you've seen them somewhere. Now, the reason why these containers are there inside Qt is pretty much historical at this point. When Qt was born, and I'm talking about 1994, give or take, C++ was well, not even there. I mean, yes, there was C++ as a language, but the first standardized version of C++ came later in 1998, to be precise. To be precise. So for a few years, Qt didn't have a standard C++ to rely upon when it came to container classes. But even after 1998, it's not that all implementations immediately provided you with a complete set of containers. Uh, for a very long time, C++ standard library implementations were incomplete, uh, or maybe you had to purchase them from third parties. Yes, there was such a time. And so Qt for a very long time, all the way up to until uh, Qt 5, did not even require you to have a working standard library implementation. And that, in a nutshell, meant that Qt had to reinvent its own container classes. So yes, of course, Qt could have done this, as an internal implementation detail, but uh, guess what? If Qt is in the problem, as the problem is, and is in the middle of reinventing these classes for itself, why not providing the very same classes to you as well? You, as an application developer, likely is, are going to have the same identical problem, the non-availability of a, a C++ standard library. And so Qt decided, hey, guess what? let's just give these uh, classes a public API. So let's make it possible for application developers to use them as well. Most of this may be historical at this point. Uh, as I mentioned, starting from Qt 5, uh, Qt actually requires your compiler to have a working standard library implementation. But nonetheless, the Qt containers are still there uh, because so many applications are using them, so they're not just going away and cause a massive havoc amongst the uh, immense code base using them. So they're still there and sometimes they get exposed by Qt APIs and so you will have to interact with them. But in a way or another, you may just be interested at uh, knowing them more in depth and maybe using them for your own application. So we're going to explore a little bit what are these classes and what they're good for, what are their pros, their cons, again, especially when compared to the ones that come from the C++ standard library. 
the question at this point may be, are the kube containers just a re-implementation of the containers coming from the tunnel library? I mean, I got things like called like QVector, QList. I've heard of those names before in the standard library, standard vector, standard list. Well, no, uh, Qt containers and standard library containers, although they share name and sometimes they share uh, very similar behaviors, they do have their fair share of differences as well. Uh, in a nutshell, this can be summarized by the fact that the Qt containers have been built with a different design philosophy. That's what it is. And so uh, this different design philosophy sometimes, well, will appear in their API and will appear in this behavior. I've tried to summarize on this slide what I mean by different design philosophy. So let's take a look together and understand what I mean. On the first line, I'm just going to saying that uh, Qt containers are double quote good enough for building GUIs. Okay. Uh, by that, I mean that, for instance, Qt containers do not support things, uh, more advanced features, I would say, such as uh, custom allocators, custom hashing functions, and stuff like that. Uh, those things are available in the C++ standard library because the standard library aims to be truly general purpose. And so from a certain point of view, Qt does a little simplification there and uses using Qt building UIs typically don't care about these advanced aspects of containers, and so Qt containers don't offer them. A uh, second aspect has to do about the API itself. Uh, the containers in the C++ standard library are, if you want, have a very minimal API. You can do with them just what you're supposed to do with a container, and not much more. So if I ask you, how do you find the index of a given element inside a standard vector? Well, there isn't a function in standard vector itself. The correct answer would be use an algorithm, use something like standard find or standard find if uh, to figure out where this element is. But Qt containers try to be a little bit more generous in their API. So their API favor this ease of use and discoverability of APIs. Inside Qt containers, inside, for instance, QVector, it's, uh, you can find functions such as contains, such as index of, and so functions which look like algorithms, but since they are so commonly used, uh, they're put there as container member functions to help you with your application development. Another aspect uh, has to do with the evolution of these containers. Uh, the containers in the Sama library evolve quite slowly. Uh, that's because the bar for evolution in the C++ community is very, very high. In order to get something in, it has to go through several rounds of review by the various uh, committees inside the standardization process. And so uh, changing something inside uh, such a, if you want, low-level class such as a container is actually a very high bar. Um, in order to do something there, especially something that changes behavior, uh, you will need to convince a lot of people that your change is for the best. The Qt containers, on the other hand, evolve more quickly, uh, sometimes even at the expense of some minor backward compatibility. In some corner cases, they may change behavior if the Qt developers thought that, yeah, it's probably a good idea to change it. While on the other hand, pretty much any behavioral change in the C++ standard library is usually not allowed. So yeah, you have it. Uh, it's trade-off there in terms of what do you want? Convenience and fast evolution or absolute stability, even if this stability hinders future development. Yes, it's a trade-off and you have to choose which side you like to be on. And then almost a little thing, a little joke, but again, if you have used Qt for more than five minutes, you may have spotted that Qt uses camel case everywhere. It does not like snake case like the C++ standard library does. I hope that's just a minor thing. Uh, you're not going to be angry at Qt for making this decision 25 years ago, or I'm almost 30 now. Uh, it's just what it is. Okay, so let's let's leave it with that one. So let me show you in code uh, a little bit what I mean here. Okay, so that we can have a better understanding of what is this convenience I'm talking about, what is this camel case story. 
So what I have here on the slide is a little bit of code in which on the first line I'm building a little vector, okay, a vector of integers, v. And then what I'm doing there is I'm appending one, two, three into the vector by using the uh, left shift operator. Now that's something that standard vector does not have, for instance, and Qt has had since forever. Uh, these days you would probably achieve the same by using some insertion, some pushback using an initializer list to use a very fancy C++ term. But yeah, that's convenient. And as I said, Qt has had this for a long, long time. I cannot even remember for how long, probably 15 years or so. Another interesting thing is what happens when you copy this vector. So on that line, uh, I'm creating a copy of V2, a copy of V, sorry, I'm calling it a copy V2. And you may expect that copy to be, uh, if you want, relatively expensive, that is involving a memory allocation for the V2 vector and then copying the data from V into V2. But that's not what happens in Qt. We're going to examine this quite uh, more in detail in the upcoming video. What happens there is pretty cheap. It's just a reference counter increase. That's because the Qt containers are implicitly shared. Then what do we do is that I'm asking if V2 contains the number 42. As I said, how do we do that in the C++ standard library? Well, that likely involves a call to an algorithm, but Qt tries to be convenient here and just gives you that algorithm, the find algorithm, the one that searches sequentially from the beginning to the end. Uh, and it gives you that functionality as a method of the vector class. That's likely because it's so common to do this that it makes sense to add a shortcut. And on the last line, I'm just asserting that the vector is not empty, which is not, it contains one, two, three, but look at the wording there. I'm calling the function called is empty and not just empty like standard vector does. Yep. So pretty straightforward, not, not as much as a difference between the, the Qt containers and the C++ containers just a little bit of difference in, as I said, in the design philosophy. Uh, hopefully this shouldn't affect your applications very much, but it's important to see that where these containers come from uh, and the evolution, of course, has impacted the API that we have today. So what are the uh, Qt containers to begin with? Qt, as I said, ships with uh, many, many containers, and I think it's useful to uh, map them, especially when compared to the C++ standard library equivalents. Uh, that is, if you know the one in Qt, then you should also know which one is the equivalent in the standard library, should you need it, and vice versa. If you come from a more broad C++ background, and therefore you want to know which is the Qt equivalent of this particular C++ container, then here it is, okay? So I filled this little table with uh, some information regarding to this. It should be pretty straightforward, but there's, there's usual a couple of twists in there that may surprise you, especially if you already know one side, one column of this uh, of this table. So on the left, I've got the Qt containers. Uh, the first one, the most important one, is called QVector, and that's a direct equivalent of the C++ standard vector uh, container class. I'm going to discuss QVector in much more detail, as I said, in an upcoming video, so I'm just going to leave this with this information for now. The second one is called QList. And now you may think that QList is the equivalent of standard list, that is, it works as a linked list, but it's not. QList is actually a very different container and it's actually different between Qt5 and Qt6. Uh, I got another video on QList, so please stay tuned with us and uh, watch this channel when we publish that video. So QList is actually does not even have a standard library equivalent uh, in Qt5. In Qt6, as we're going to see, uh, QList was changed to become like QVector. And so in Qt6, QList is actually a similar to standard vector. So what is uh, the linked list implementation in Qt? Well, that has a very specific name. It's called QLinked list. And that's the direct equivalent of standard list. That is a double linked list a list in which the nodes are linked to the previous and to the next one, and so that you can iterate in uh, both directions. The C++ standard library also has another linked list implementation. It's called forward list, 
and that's a single linked list implementation. So one that you can only iterate forward in one direction. You cannot backtrack. But that one does not even have a direct uh, Qt equivalent. In Qt, there is this other container class called QVar Length Array. That's a mouthful of a name. Uh, that one does not have a direct equivalent in the standard library, but uh, we're, we're going to discuss that one. We're going to see that this can be more or less emulated uh, in C++, although it does not have a direct equivalent. And things like DEC, things like standard array, they simply don't have an equivalent at all in the C++, sorry, in Qt. And uh, similarly, let's talk about the associative containers that come with the Qt and the equivalent in the C++ in library. So Qt comes with a uh, bunch of them, and they mostly have a pretty much direct equivalent in the C++ standard library. So things like QMap, Multimap are the same thing like standard map and standard multimap. Uh, QHash and QMultiHash, they have the equivalent in uh, standard unordered map and unordered multimap. QSet is a bit of a cooler one because QSet is not like standard set. Uh, QSet is more like standard unordered set. So it's a set that does not preserve the internal ordering. And as you can see, there are no equivalents in Qt for standard set, multiset, and also the unordered multiset. They're simply not there. Why is that? Well, I don't know. I guess Qt developers didn't find them particularly useful or particularly needed at large, and so they're just not provided. There's also a last one, which is called QFlatMap. Uh, that's an ordered, so uh, associative container, so similar to QMap if you want. Uh, however, that one internally uh, keeps the pairs of keys and values uh, inside the contiguous storage, typically vector instances. And this may give you benefits when you want, for instance, to scan an entire map or iterate over it, uh, benefits in terms of memory allocations. There isn't an equivalent of QFlatMap in C++. One is being proposed by P0429. Uh, there is a link in the description if you want to research more about what this is all about. Uh, and also at this moment, QFlatMap is not public API. Uh, it is available in a header that you can just include it and use it. Uh, but be aware that this particular class is not under the same um, promises of compatibility as the rest of Qt. That is a problem for you. So that's a long list of uh, Qt container classes. Let's start by discussing what do they have in common, okay, before we analyze their differences. So the first thing that they do have all in common, uh, pretty much, is that they all feature something called implicit sharing. That's a very fancy word, a very fancy term, or, well, two words actually, but uh, what is it all about? We're going to see this right away in the next video in this series. There is There are a couple of exceptions in there. Uh, notably, QVAR length array is one of the containers that actually deep copy. There it's not implicitly shared, uh, but it's really one amongst all of them. Uh, all the others behave in a very similar way, which is, in a nutshell, when you copy them, the copy is super cheap. All these containers also have very similar requirements uh, when it comes to the stored data types. And these requirements are unfortunately a little bit restrictive or more restrictive uh, than the requirements that the standard library uh, imposes on your data types. So in order to store a data type inside a Qt container, typically this data type has to be uh, default constructible and copyable. For a lot of cases, this doesn't matter because most data types, most value types are indeed default constructible and copyable. But these days, we also live in, uh, in, the, in the era of, for instance, move only types, things like a standard unique pointer, standard thread, standard future, uh, you name it. There's plenty of classes that are move only. And uh, at the moment, you cannot put them inside a cute container. You must resort to a standard library container in case your class, again, is not copyable. And these classes do exist. Finally, a little note about the index data type uh, in uh, random access containers, things like QVector or QList. Uh, for many reasons, this index data type is signed. 
So it's not unsigned like in the standard ones, but uh, it is a sign and it's just a plain int uh, in Qt5. And this plain int has been actually upgraded to another data type called QSide type in Qt6. Uh, what is QSide type? It's just an alias to a 32 or 64 bit signed integer uh, that depends on the platform you're running on. And so uh, this data type allows you to store potentially more than uh, uh, two to the power of 32 or whatever elements inside uh, a Qt container should you need to do that. Uh, this change uh, is it's nice, okay. Uh, there was not very little reason not to have this uh, bigger data type given the commonality of 64-bit architectures. Uh, however, it's a little bit of unknowing when it comes to do a Qt5 to Qt6 port because some compilers are very pedantic and they may uh, trigger warnings if you if you try to store a Q size type inside an int, for instance. They may tell you, look, you're narrowing here. That's not exactly good. Uh, my suggestion for you, if, should you encounter this kind of warnings from your compiler, is, for instance, if you want to make your code compile in both Qt5 and Qt6, which you should probably do if you're doing such a port, is use auto rather than explicitly stating what is the data type that you're using. Uh, typically, that lets you give away with the with the complexity of maintaining this code base between Qt5 and Qt6. Uh, just use something like auto i equal container index of element, and so that i becomes int in Qt5 and QSides type in Qt6, and you will not have these warnings from your compiler. If you're wondering why in the world are these indices signed, right? That's probably the question right now, because when you think about a container, a container does not have negative positions inside of it. You can only have, it only has positive or let's say non-negative positions. Well, the history again is very long and complicated, but Think about this for just a second. I mentioned to you that Qt containers have functions such as index of, a function that retrieves which index, uh, at which index a given value appears. What should that function return in case that particular value is not in the container? It's easy just to return minus one, just to return a negative number if that value is not there. But if all you have are positive or non-negative indices, what are you going to return? Something like string n pos? I'm pretty sure nobody likes that. And so that's the reason. Practically speaking, it's just much more easy to use integers or signed quantities rather than unsigned quantities. And that's why Qt went with that one. Okay, this concludes our first video in this series. Uh, please subscribe to our channel to get uh, notifications when we publish the next ones. In the next one, I'm actually going to discuss implicit sharing much more in detail. Uh, so stay tuned for that one. And as usual, have a good day.